<laughs> what you say, Cannon, will be used against you. <laughs> Welcome, everybody. It's Monday night, February 7th. I don't know. I'm retired. Neil's birthday. <laughs> I know the feel. Neil's birthday was yesterday. Oh, well, happy birthday. <laughs> 19, right? Yeah. <laughs> what time or two? Prematurely gray, but anyway. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> um, is the camera good? We're not catching the corner of your computer, are we? Uh, a little bit. It'll be all right. All right, okay. Um, we're picking up in chapter 3 of Revelation with the uh, letter to the church in Sardis. Um, you have got the PowerPoint presentation from the beginning last week through the four horsemen, which we may or may not get to tonight. Right? Depends on you and me. Right? Okay. <clears throat> 700 years earlier than this letter was written, Sardis is one of the greatest cities in the world. It was an impregnable citadel on the top of the hill. And everybody who lived there thought that they were safe. But Cyrus of Persia routed them after scaling the wall and finding the city unguarded because they thought they were safe and didn't need any guards. So... The command is to watch. Don't get complacent. Is that the word? Complacent? Is that I want? Yeah. Okay. I'll use that one for a while. All right, let's read this letter. Chapter 3. And to the angel of the church in Sardis, write the words of him who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your works. You have the reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Wake up and strengthen what remains and is about to die, for I have not found your works complete in the sight of my God. Remember then what you received and heard. Keep it and repent. If you will not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what hour I will come against you. Yet you have still a few names in Sardis, people who have not soiled their garments, and they will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. The one who conquers will be clothed thus in white garments, and I will never blot his name out of the book of life. I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. <clears throat> <clears throat> All right, so this is from the one who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. What are the seven spirits? Seven, seven angels, leaders, uh, guides of the churches, right? Mm -hmm. And the seven stars are? Seven no, the lampstands are the churches. Oh, okay. Stars are the same thing. Stars are the angels, angels of the churches, churches, right? From the end of chapter one. Okay. Right. where it says <clears throat> the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven lampstands are the seven churches okay. um, <clears throat> the seven spirits who are before the throne right? seven spirits of God from way back in chapter 1 verse 4 okay. you have grace and Grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come, Father, from the seven spirits who are before his throne, not the Holy Spirit, but the seven archangels, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and ruler of kings on earth. All right. So, to this church at Sardis, he starts out by saying, identifying himself as I have the seven spirits of God, seven archangels, and the seven angels of the churches. So, I have the leaders, the spiritual guides, angelic guides, right, of your churches. <clears throat> I know your works. You think you are alive, and some others think you're alive, but you are dead. <clears throat> so, what does that kind of church look like? not be 
must not be taking care of things like they should? Or well, that's partly it, but what, what, what is, <clears throat> how can you look like you're alive when in fact you're dying? Misleading. Well, it's misleading, but what, what does a live church look like that we might, somebody who really knows would say, you know, they think they're alive because what's happening? They're active. They're active. A lot of things going on. Okay. All right. Are they doing it for Jesus? No. Not always. So you look like you're alive. You're active. You're growing. You're doing things, you know. People know about you, all right? But... If it's not done in love, in the name of Jesus, and you're dead. You're dead. Okay. So, in a way, it might be similar to uh, to the first church, Ephesus. Um, you have lost your first love. You have been concerned about um, making judgments about false teachers and good doctrine, but you're not doing it in a spirit of love. You're being judgmental and all that, right? Okay. So. All right, <clears throat> so they look like they're alive, and they have that reputation, but they're dead. So the warning and command is to wake up, strengthen what remains and is about to die. So there's still something good that they can, you know, the, the, the candle isn't out yet, but it's about to. So if you don't trim the wick and... You know, and it helped the flame to keep going, it's good to go out on it. But you've got to do something now. Okay. Strengthen what remains. So how would you do that? Have you ever been part of a of a dying church? And one of those that's so small now that they can't pay their bills and you know, they keep trying to do the same old things that they used to, but now that's not working and they come to worship and a few people come to Sunday school and you know, what else happens? How did they get that way? Somehow you've lost, you've lost your people or you've lost... Okay, but wh why? They're why, not flexible. Why did, they don't want to grow. Okay, they don't want to grow. They don't want to change what they've done. They want to, what are the seven last words of a dying church? Oh, you've all we've always that. done it this way. Well, or something. We've never done <laughs> it that like way we've before. We've never done it that way. <laughs> <laughs> So there's no desire to change or grow, mm -hmm. right? It's my church. It isn't Jesus' church. Mm -hmm. okay. Okay. <clears throat> All those kinds of things, right? Okay. But there's enough there yet. If you strengthen it, you can still live. So how do you strengthen a church body that is dying? What do you latch on to to get it to grow again? Revive that life. Start new programs. New <clears throat> ways. I don't know. Might be new programs, but what would they be based on? In what way would they be different than what you're doing? Because right. something's got to change. They've got to be different somehow, right? So, what would be different about your new program? Maybe a, a new outreach program. Um, what, but what would be different basic. about this outreach program from the other outreach program? Something different. <laughs> you know it yeah, right. what? <laughs> but for God's, for God. on for the God's glory. Yes. Okay. And it's got to help people. It's not about us. For instance, when, when you get um, people to visit the church, all right, often sometimes, most of the time, we use language that says, we need you here. Right? It's good to have you, you know, we need you here. Or in discussions and committees, right? We need to get new members. No, that's not right. People need Jesus. And if they can find him here, that's a good thing. But we don't need new members. People need Jesus. Mm -hmm. If they sense the presence of God and Jesus here in worship and in study and fellowship events, then they'll be able to find Jesus. Right? Okay. But it's not about our church. We don't need them. They need Jesus. Okay. So that so a new program, a new outreach, has got to be all about the people who need Jesus. If we forget that, it'll be our country club. 
it'll be our church, our business, you know, then we need them. Or we're going to die because we can't pay the bills. Right? Have you ever said that? Most of us have, one time or another. Okay? Oh, yeah. In one way or another. Right? So some of it is, is the language and the focus, right? Strengthen what remains. And what remains is going to be based on faith. I mean, that's the stuff he's talking about, right? Okay. <clears throat> I have not found your works complete in the sight of my God. So what makes a work complete? He certainly doesn't mean that you haven't finished it, right? <clears throat> but they're not, they're not whole. Okay. I think it'd be the same thing, right? If our if thought, your face says so. You did I hear you correctly? You said he doesn't mean that they're not finished. Is that the question you asked? Complete. He's found our works. No. You have not found your works complete, so they're incomplete. He's not simply saying, you haven't finished your work. That's a pretty fine line between finished and complete. Maybe. I brought my exacto knife. Well, <laughs> in the last, I don't know, four or five sermons, probably three times I've drawn a comparison between the New Testament use of perfect Mm -hmm. and complete but when Jesus work was finished he said or complete he said it is finished mm -hmm. and Paul calls that perfect so like all three of those words are kind of floating around in there with the same or similar meaning perfect complete and finished so that's why I'm not picking up on the distinction between complete and finished the way you're Describing it. Well, none of our works are going to complete until Jesus returns. Right? And we just have to keep. So it's, <clears throat> it's not like, well, we, we ran that program and it's done now. Right. You know, he's not talking about that kind of finished uh, and complete. Okay. <clears throat> right? That's helpful. Okay. So, um, I have not found your works complete in the sight of my God. Their, their, their work... Of being alive means they're busy they, they look like there's a lot of life there but they're really dying because the life that they're living isn't for Jesus it's not based on faith except for some who are there or some of the things they're doing are still focused on Jesus for the sake of the people that he died for okay. Okay. <coughs> So there's a sense there in which we're off base. Yeah, we and we haven't finished. Okay, there's still a lot to do yet. Okay, so um, it there's got to be some of that in there. You're right about that. Okay, okay. it's got to be some of that in there. Okay, all right. But it, but it wasn't just you haven't finished the program. Okay, there's more to the completeness of their works. All right. Okay. <coughs> So then it continues, remember, see if, if, if we continue, if we can't fill out this whole thing. Remember then what you received and heard. What would that be? The gospel. Yeah, the gospel. The gospel. Okay. Again, it's back to Jesus and the people for whom he died. Okay. And the fellowship of believers. The, the fellowship, the family that he brings us to. Okay. So remember, right? sometimes we just got to go back to the beginning and start all over. Sometimes we just get so messed up, so off base. It's like, let's go back to basics, right? Everybody does that. I don't care what you're doing. If things aren't working anymore, okay? How many of you play golf? I did. Oh, God. All tried. right. Um, <laughs> how many of you ever swung a baseball bat? Okay, good. We got something to work with. <laughs> All right. Okay? All right. If, you, if, you're, if it, you start out and you're hitting the ball pretty decently, but then all of a sudden you're missing all the time, what do you do? How do you fix that? You go back to basics, right? Mm -hmm. You check your stance, the way you're holding the bat, the plane that you're swinging on, you know, whether or not you're keeping your eye on the ball, right? All that. So you go back to basics. Then you start all over again, 
because obviously you started swinging differently. Mm -hmm. okay. So you go back to basics. So here too, remember what you rece received and heard. We got the gospel. We heard it. We believed it. We started that way. Okay. Again, it's very similar to, to the, uh, the command to Ephesus. Huh? You forgot your first love. Okay. Their emphasis was on, again, um, judging everybody and what they said and what they taught and proper doctrine. Okay? Um, in Sardis, um, it's just that they, they, they're busy and busy and busy, but it's not all for Jesus. So let's get refocused. Right? Remember whose church this really is. Okay? All right. And repent. Keep it. Keep the word that you heard and repent. If you will not wake up, I will come like a thief. You will not know at what hour I will come against you. Those are scary words. <laughs> to have Jesus come against you. Yet you have still a few names in Sardis, people who have not soiled their garments. Soiled their garments. What does that mean to you? They're still in the faith. All right, still in the faith. All right, they've kept them pure and clean. I mean, see, now, some of this stuff is pretty easy. I mean, we don't have to make it real deep. It's a simple analogy, okay? And they will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. And what makes them worthy? They're still in the faith. Their faith, okay? Right. Right. The one who conquers will be clothed thus in white garments, and I will never blot his name out of the book of life. I will never blot his name out. I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. Remember that part in the Gospels? Jesus says, if you are embarrassed by me, I will be embarrassed by you before my father and the angels. Right? But if you confess my name, I will confess you before my father and his holy angels. Right? He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says. So in what way, um, here in this congregation, is there what seems to be life, but it's kind of off base are there things that we've gotten to be doing that we just do because we've always done it and we forgot why every year in my churches in Pennsylvania we used to have rally day we didn't have um, uh, oh shoot, what do you guys do um, homecoming we didn't have homecoming we had rally, rally day, day. Mm -hmm. and, but it could be many different things it, it could focus on many different things so every year I would ask the Christian Ed Committee or whoever was responsible. Um, so why are we having Rally Day this year? And they thought I was trying to say, let's not do it anymore. Why are we having it? No, I meant, what's, what's the, the purpose, purpose this the year? What's the purpose? Is it bring a friend Sunday? Is it church picnic day? Is you know what is it? And so we had to organize the morning to fulfill that purpose. We had to set the room up a certain way with the tables and chairs because. If it's bring a friend Sunday, you know, or if it's church extra. picnic Sunday, we have worship. We don't have Sunday school. We go to the park and have a picnic. We don't need, you know, it's just, <laughs> so you had to know how you were going to set things up for the day and what you were going to advertise and what slogan you were going to use. So why are we doing it this year? What kind of a day is it going to be? Right. So we have to ask that sometimes, right? Okay. So, and if you can't, and if part of the answer is not about Jesus or serving people, then you ought to quit. Because then it's not about the gospel. Right? So anytime, and every year you, you start something new, whenever you start it, it, you know, in January or in September, whenever it comes up, you, you can ask yourself the question, why are we doing this? What's our focus? And how does it lift up Jesus and how does it serve people? And if it doesn't, then pitch it. Okay, I can say that because I don't go here. <laughs> See, we've, we've been talking. All right. Anyway, <coughs> every Tuesday, pastors meet and we talk. All right, okay. All right. Um, but that's what he's saying here, okay? That's, that's what he's saying to the church in Sardis, all right? Um, again, the word conquer means to to take over completely, be fully in charge. Okay. 
So if you remain faithful, fully faithful, then you will receive a white robe and your name will be written in the book or not be blotted out. And he will say our name to his father and the holy angels. He will confess us. All right. <clears throat> Next slide. Philadelphia. Philadelphia means brotherly love. Okay. It was a missionary city used by the Greeks to spread the Greek culture and language. It was just a great place that opened, you know, just open all around. And right? it was an open door to other cities. It was on a volcanic plain. It suffered tremors because it was so near the volcano. Many lived outside the city for safety reasons so that the city walls and buildings wouldn't fall on them. So they made their smaller homes outside. Uh, there was fertile soil that was good for grapes. So they probably had a lot of wine, right? Mm -hmm. They received a new name after the Caesars two times. First it was called Neo Caesarea, the new city of Caesar. And then later it was called Flavia after the family named Flavius. And then it was called Philadelphia again. Okay. All right. So <clears throat> let's read the letter. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia, write the words of the Holy One, the true one who has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut, who shuts and no one opens. I know your works. Behold, I have set before you an open door which no one is able to shut. Well, that goes right along with what he just said about himself. Huh? He's got the, he um, has the key of David to open and sh shut. I know that you have but little power, and yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. Behold, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say that they are Jews and are not, but lie. Behold, I will make them come and bow down before your feet, and they will learn that I have loved you. Because you have kept my word about patient endurance, I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming on the whole world to try those who dwell on the earth. I am coming soon. Hold fast what you have so that no one may seize your crown. The one who conquers, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. Never shall he go out of it, and I will write on him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down from my God out of heaven, and my new, my own new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So what's wrong with the church of Philadelphia? Nothing. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Nothing. He only has good things to say. <clears throat> yep, only has good things to say. Okay? <clears throat> Alright, so <clears throat> he addresses them as the words of the Holy One, <clears throat> the True One, which is the way they are, being holy and true. They are faithful. They're, they're, he's got nothing against them. They're living the life of faith, just like the True One and the Holy One, right? He has the key of David to open and shut. So Philadelphia, not only for the Greek culture, but now he says for the church is going to be, you're going to have an open door to go out and spread the gospel. I'm going to break down barriers and, and give you places to go so that you, in town and out of town and across town and, you know, to the cities nearby, whatever. Okay. <clears throat> um, he's going to open the door for them. Okay. I know that you have but little power. So they're a small group, right? They're not doing mighty things. They're just being faithful in their everyday lives. Okay. But they've kept his word. They've not denied his name. Okay. They've not been embarrassed. Okay. And they have been persecuted and uh, bothered and harassed by the Jews around who are a synagogue of Satan. Okay. Now, one of the things we have to realize is... is um, <clears throat> the Jews are kind of in a, a middle position, right? The Jews are always the people of God. They've never been unchosen. Okay? In Romans, somewhere 9, 10, 11, in that whole section, Paul says, the call of God is irrevocable. So when God called the Jews to be his people, to witness to the world, so he could bless the whole, you know, all the nations, 
<clears throat> he never unchose them, never revoked that call. So the Jews, okay, now he can't use many of them because they're not being obedient. They don't give a hoot about that call and that mission that God gave to Abraham. Okay, so he can't use them, but he'd like to because they're his chosen people. Right? The church has been grafted into them, be, into the, the Jews, because we believe in the Jewish Messiah. And, and God's intention was to bring everybody to be a part of his people. Right? Not that we would all become Jews, but that we would all become God's family. Okay? <clears throat> all right, so whenever we see, I think, in all the New Testament, okay, it isn't always Jews against Christians. Sometimes it's Jews against Jews. If you read the Gospels, that's what we have. It's a bunch of Jewish people who don't like this one Jewish guy named Jesus and some of his disciples. It's a Jewish story. It's not a Christian story. It's a Jewish story. Right? You get that? Mm -hmm. Okay. Don't ever forget that the four Gospels are a Jewish story about a bunch of Jews who don't like this Jewish guy named Jesus. And yet God called this one particular Jew, right? Send him as his son. Right? You know the rest of the story. <clears throat> All right, so I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews and are not. So what does that mean? If you say, well, I'm a Jew, but God would say, oh, no, you're not. <laughs> What, what's the difference? The guy who's saying, but I'm a Jew. He's not a believer. Or he's not a believer. Well, when he says, I'm a Jew, what is he saying? There's got to be two things true about him. Following the law of Moses? Well, you got to be circumcised. Circumcised. got to be circumcised. Okay. And your Jew. mother had to be Jewish. Mm -hmm. Then you're a Jew. Okay? Right? Unless you're a proselyte, unless you... Convert. Come to you unless you convert, yeah. Okay, all right, and then you're circumcised. Okay, <clears throat> so he's saying, I'm a Jew, but God says, No, you're not. You're in the synagogue of Satan, you're in the fellowship and the gathering of people who, who follow Satan. So they're not practicing Jews, they're not worshiping the one true God, they're fighting against Him. Okay, so in the Gospel of John. He also will say, then, the Jews. And he's normally talking about the Jewish leaders who are fighting against Jesus and God's plan. Okay? All right. Okay. All right. <clears throat> they lie. Okay. Well, you can't be a Jew if you're not working for God. All right. Okay. Behold, I will make them come and bow down before your feet, and they will learn that I have loved you. Does, doesn't he love them anymore? Well, so yeah, he yeah, God is love. He lo okay, he's disappointed, he's angry, he's upset, he's bothered, he's frustrated, but he loves them. Okay, you don't get that way unless you love somebody. Okay. <clears throat> but they will come and bow down at your feet. Because you have kept my word about patient endurance, I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming on the whole world. Keep you from... Okay. Can be interpreted several ways. Um, Does that mean you won't be won't be punished for things, or? Well, what's the trial? I'll keep you from the trial. What's the trial? The second coming, when there's a judgment, mm -hmm. the time of tribulation. Or? Okay. Tribulation, tough times, mm -hmm. tests. Okay, where you are asked to be faithful. And, mm -hmm. and you might be tempted not to be, to give in to, you know, the, the ways of the world instead of the ways of the church, right? the, the ways of God. Okay. I will keep you from, could mean um, you won't be a part of that. I'll keep you completely out of it. Or I will get you through it. Okay, those are basically our two best options. Okay. Um, well, we know that God's not going to keep them out of it because of the rest of the New Testament and the rest of Revelation. <laughs> we, we don't get to get out of it, right? So, he's going to get us through it. Okay. 
I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming on the whole earth to try those who dwell on the earth. Try them for what? To try those. When, when you are tried, what's that mean? Tried and true, what does that mean? Tested. 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 Judged. And judged after the testing. Okay. If you're tried and true, you've passed That's the, the test. test. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right. So God is going to come and test all those who dwell on the earth. I'm coming soon. So hang on for a little while longer. Right? Be this patient endurance. Keep it up for a little while longer. Hold fast what you have. Don't let it go. So that no one may seize your crown. Okay. Do they have their crown yet? No, that doesn't come until you know, the judgment day. Okay, so the one who conquers, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. You know, a pillar is a pillar in the church. The guy is holding things up. You can hold things up in two ways, right? You can be the big support that maintains the stability, or you can be holding things up so they don't get done. You can get in the way, right? We use that phrase both ways, right? So, but anyway, in this case, it's going to be somebody who's going to be holding up the structure for in a good way, right? I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. Never shall he go out of it, right? So, I mean, that's a good thing, a privilege to to be allowed to always be in the temple and, and to be a leader and a support and all that kind of stuff. I will write on him several things. What are they? The name of my God, which means a, a seal. You you belong to him. You've got his name written on you, tattooed on you, right? Um, the name of the city of my God, the New Jerusalem. Why is that significant that you'd have the city written on you? The name of the city. It's like saying, I'm come, I come from Hickory. Mm -hmm. and it, That's it. A place. So you come from God. Okay. What do we call people from Hickory. Hikorians? Hikorians. Okay. okay. I like Hikorians. <laughs> That's a silly thing. All right. Anyway. All right. So, it, and the New Jerusalem is God's city, right? So you come from the city of God. You Again, you belong to him. Huh? Comes, where does it come from? From heaven. Ah, oh, really? From God. And, and, and where does it end up? Where does it end up? Out of heaven, you're from God. Where does it end up? Here. Yeah, here. <laughs> yeah. It comes down out of heaven from, from God earth. to the earth. Yeah. And I'm going to write my own new name on you. So we'll belong to Jesus too, huh? Mm -hmm. yeah. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says. You know, keep up the good work, don't give up. So that one's pretty simple, right? <clears throat> the the uh, keep you from the hour of trial might be a verse where somebody could go and say, see, there's the rapture. I'm going to keep you from the hour of trial. You won't have to go through it because I'm going to take you out. Okay? All right. That's all we're going to say on that. <laughs> Can you talk about the new name? A little bit. Is there any, anything more that we know about that? Um, yes. <clears throat> what chapter are we in? Three. 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 Where does that come in? That, the name pillar after the pillar. Yeah, yeah, that was 12. Verse 12. 12. Yeah. <clears throat> pillar, the metaphor of the pillar. Anyone has a pillar? Oopsie. Finish it. All right, the other book. Brought both for a reason. Uh -huh. mine, mine doesn't have anything on the new name. No kidding. Yeah. Oh, 
Philadelphia, situated on. Sorry. Sorry. You can pause the tape if you want. No, no, no. No, I, I can't pause it once, okay. I, once okay. I stop Sorry. it. I have to start a new one. I thought I would remember that, but it's not coming to me. Chapter. I just, I, I don't know that yeah. I've seen that anywhere else. And it just seems like the new name. The new right. name. Yeah. Why would he need a new name? Because he is the eternal Son of God. Well, from the beginning. Yeah. You know. Right. My own new name. So explanation. Those who conquer will be made pillars in the temple of God. A feature that suggests that the New Jerusalem should be understood as a metaphor for the Christian community rather than an enormous material building. Revelation is a book containing numerous graffiti. Conquering Christians will have inscribed on them the names of God, the city of God, and the New Jerusalem, varied metaphors indicating eschatological salvation, which means at the end of time, right? Reference to the New Jerusalem that descends from heaven anticipates the more detailed description in chapter 21 and 22 of the new heaven and the new earth. Philadelphia was near the region where Montanism or the new prophecy arose after the middle of the second century, emphasizing the imminent great tribulation and the descent of the New Jerusalem. Well, that doesn't say anything about the new name. Well, let me go back into the more technical notes. Sorry, that what was verse. No, verse I'll twelve. Twelve. My own new name. The bestowal of a new name in biblical tradition ordinarily means a change of status or function for a city or nation, or a change in the character, conduct, or status of an individual. Speaking of the future glory of restored Israel, Isaiah 62 reads, You shall be called by a new name, which the mouth of the Lord will give. And then in chapter 65, it speaks of the righteous, but his servants he will call by a different name. In early Christianity, the new name of Isaiah 62 and 65 was thought to be the name Christian. That's, but that, you know, if it's his own new name, Jesus' own, that's kind of what you're asking, right? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. right. The new name may have been meaningful to the Galatians. The name of their city had been renamed twice. The first new name was New Caesarea, given to the city after the earthquake, the second flood. We already said that. Well, that's no help either. Okay. So this is just the first of three volumes on Revelation, so we should have said something about it. Maybe we won't know that time. Nobody else knows what the new name is. No, we don't. Um, and I don't think it, it comes up later either, actually. Uh, I, I mean, all the names that we have, we're going to recognize. There isn't a... Okay. Um, it's a uh, surprise. I don't know. What do you think? Hmm? My own new name. Well, any time an Old Testament figure was was given a new name, like Jacob became Israel or Abram Abr became Abraham, Abraham. Yeah. it was something that God had done in their lives and something, uh, I don't know that, I'm, I'm hesitant to say a change of purpose, but... Um, focus, change of focus. Focus or now a recipient of the promise, maybe. Um, yeah, but there's some. There was some change, and God was the the reason for the change. Yeah, yeah, always. Yeah. So, and well, Jesus and you know, I, I mean, Jesus. His name was Jesus. It means Savior, right? God saves. Yeah. Same as Joshua in the Old yeah. Testament Hebrew. Joshua, Greek Jesus means the same thing. Um. New name, what? He, Jesus Christ. The name that is above every name, Philippians mm -hmm. 2. Right? Um, 
you receive a name that is above every name, that every knee in heaven on earth should should bow, right? So, would would this have been written before or after all the all the renaming of this city? After. Okay, so is it maybe a word of comfort that just because their name has changed doesn't mean is that too much of a stretch? Well, every time the city was renamed, it was because somebody else was Caesar, or or it had or it had a new purpose, or it was rebuilt after a earthquake or something. Okay, um, and who rebuilt it? Right. So the fact that that it's God the Father who sends Jesus to bring us all together into the church, and we will live in the new city, the new Jerusalem. Um, but we're going to be called by His new name. The problem is, what new name does Jesus get? I mean, you know, I, yeah. I can, you know, a good question, but I can't answer it. Okay. We had one pastor who insisted on saying Jesus the Christ. Yeah, because it's his title. It's not his last name. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. But was he called the Savior until after he was saved, after he was resurrected? Until after, after his resurrection. See, so that would be a new name. But Yeah, it wouldn't have to be that he got the new name. Right then. Right now, here. You know, yeah. Now we're at the, or when he comes again, but, he, you know. But he, no, he, but he's always been the Redeemer. He's always been the Savior. Yeah, I started to say the Jewish people that believed that he was coming, yeah. he, they mm -hmm. believed he was the promised yeah. Savior. Yeah. But so. he wasn't called that, though, until after that he was done. I mean, they were expecting him. Would, I mean, could that be his name until after he was our Savior? Hmm. They were calling <coughs> for the Savior. But yeah, Messiah and Christ mean anointed one, mm -hmm. who was the one who okay. paid the ransom, redeemed us, mm -hmm. saved us, <coughs> healed us, comforted us, gives us life. I mean, it, it's all wrapped up in one package. Um, so, good thought. So, but I don't know what else to do with it. <laughs> I'm surprised this didn't say more about it because it's got all kinds of stuff it's like I don't care about that I don't care about that <laughs> so, I find that in a lot of commentary that, that it's like why do they skip right over that it's like they, they, they don't know they don't know either Yeah. So I don't feel so bad okay. all right. so the next city is Laodicea or Laodicea, you can say it any way you want to. It's on the main road between Ephesus and Syria. It's a great banking and financial center. And it was so wealthy, it could pay for its own recovery after a devastating earthquake. They did not have to borrow money from Rome or, or, or be given any. They could pay for it themselves. Okay. Um, they were the center of clothing manufacturing. They had a great medical center. They were famous for their uh, for ointments for the ears and eyes. That's significant when we read the letter. Okay. And many Jews lived there. There was a big Jewish population there. Okay. All right. So the letter <coughs> to Laodicea. And to the angel of the church in Laodicea, write the words of the Amen. What does Amen mean? It is certainly true. It is certainly true. The faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation. So why is that significant that he uses that title? It's all about truth, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Amen. Faithful, true witness, the beginning of God's creation. Um, according to the Old Testament, in, in a good bit of Proverbs, what's, what or who was the first of God's creation? Uh, oh, person? Or the first. Christ? I'll leave it at that. Christ? Hmm? Christ? Hmm. Of creation? The first? 
wisdom. I think it's Proverbs 8. Is that Proverbs 8? Oh. See, I gave him a question that stumped him, and now he's testing. <laughs> I to get him back. Okay. Right. Anyway. Even, even. Yeah. Um, the, the first of God's creation is, is wisdom, which which would be His word. Okay. Because wisdom is always expounded in words that, and in the creation itself. Okay. Right. Anyway. Um, the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation. I know your works, you are neither hot nor cold. Would that you were either hot or cold. No. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold. Now that's three times you said you're not <laughs> either one. Okay. All right. I will vomit you out of my mouth. The word is, it's, it's a forceful spitting out. It's a vomit. Okay. Yeah, what's, he, what's he saying? You make me sick. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. I mean, think of food, food that's supposed to be hot, that has now kind of gotten almost cool, Good right? Warm. Oh, it tastes terrible, right? Okay. All right. Okay. And food that's supposed to be chilled, and now it's gotten warm, mm, it's, it's, not, it's not right, right? Okay. All right. It makes you sick. For you say, I am rich, I have prospered, and I need nothing. But realizing, not realizing, that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire, so that you may be rich. And white garments, so that you may clothe yourself, and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen. And salve to anoint your eyes, so that you may see. Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline, so be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and eat with him, and he with me. The one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne, as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. They're going to pile up thrones. <laughs> he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Right? Hot or cold? <clears throat> so what does a hot church look like? Uh, I guess Philadelphia. On Philadelphia. fire for the Lord. Okay. Right. Right. Now they were quiet, quietly burning. They weren't making a big fuss, but they were just quietly living their lives as Christians, doing the right stuff, loving people, serving people in the name of Jesus. Right. Right. So if you're a hot church, you're, kind of, you're like on fire for the Lord, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Would you call this a, a hot church? Mm -mm -mm. You're not on fire? Okay. To some degree. Right. To some things, but not. Okay. Right. How about cold? What's a cold church look like? You ever visited a church and said, oh my gosh, they were pretty cold? Mm. Oh, yeah. Nobody's that's, that's pretty obvious, right? Mm. Nobody's I mean, friendly and nobody acknowledges you're there. Or uh, Kathy and I always go to church when we're on vacation. We used to... Uh, uh, Go to the state bowling tournament, mixed doubles bowling mm -hmm. tournament mm -hmm. in Pennsylvania. Um, and we'd always, the, the guy that made all the reservations and set everything up, he'd always get us a Sunday afternoon bowling time, not Sunday morning, because mm -hmm. he always knew we'd, we'd go to church. So we were up in the Poconos someplace. Uh, I forget the name of the town, but <clears throat> we went to church Sunday. Nice little, pretty, fairly new Lutheran church. And we sat down and the pews were fairly full because it's a small church and they were uh, a lot of people there um, and we were obviously Lutherans because we knew what to do <laughs> when to stand and when to <laughs> yeah okay All right. and it was Father's Day weekend and nobody talked to us until we not when we went in and when we left the guy who was standing at the door handing out Father's Day pins said happy father's day and that's the only thing anybody said to us mm. oh in the poconos are a it's a vacation area in the northeast of <laughs> pennsylvania and, and it's like <laughs> we had no occasion to go back there but we certainly wouldn't have because nobody talked to us and it's like well they're obvious lutherans we could talk to them <laughs> but <laughs> No. So that was a cold congregation. Okay. 
no matter how much they read their Bibles and prayed, right? And you said it was a relatively new church. Yeah, yeah I mean, the building, the building was, I don't know how old the congregation was, but yeah. the church itself was, yeah. was pretty new. And, Sometimes when people visit, they don't wait or they don't, um, you know, it's, they're out the door mm -hmm. fairly fast yeah. before you can even get to them to say, mm -hmm. Hello, yeah, who yeah. are you or how? But we were in no hurry. Okay. And we sat, we always sit in the middle because we know the members sit on the ends. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> so when we go visit the church, we always sit in the middle of a pew. So you're not in anybody's so, seat. <laughs> um, probably not, yeah. <laughs> um, and we did the same thing there. Um, and there were people sitting on both sides of us, you know, one person away. Okay. They left an empty spot between us, okay. But nobody talked to us and the service was really well done the pastor had a good sermon good children's sermon and it was well done you know but maybe you weren't the only visitors maybe a lot of them were visitors too yeah but they should have paid attention to me i was the important visitor <laughs> i think in two in in miller's church um of course, I married into the church, so I haven't been here. That was your first time. mistake. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, marrying <laughs> or coming oh, to this church. <laughs> Take it any way you want. Now, <laughs> Wait a minute, now you married a heifer. Can't be so bad. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but anyhow, I know that some people, this, is, this church has a lot of family history. Mm -hmm. It goes back generations and generations. And... I know some people have been upset when they've been approached and welcomed as a visitor when they've been members, members here, here for a long time. <laughs> so sometimes well, they happens. should show up more often. Yes, that's true. <laughs> then they wouldn't be thought of as a visitor, right? Yeah. Yeah. I don't care. So, I still go get them. <laughs> well, I don't know. I'm well, there's so well, glad to see you today. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 And, and introduce yourself. You know, so I don't know you. I'm Susie Q. You know, what's your name? And then, you know, and you may, may still not know if they're members or not. But <laughs> see, there's a great it, reason it is to tricky. invite a friend to come to church with you. And they don't know anybody else. And then you have a reason to introduce everybody. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> well, I had my one church, I had everybody saying, they, everybody just kept saying for a number of weeks, okay, I don't know half the people here. I don't know half the people here. So on Sunday morning during announcements, I said, I have a special announcement. Half of you don't know the other half. Because <laughs> you keep telling me, I don't know half the people here. Okay, so they all chuckled just like you did. All right? And I said, so here's what we're going to do. We happen to have coffee hour that week, fellowship after church. So I said, during our coffee hour after church today, I want you to walk up to people and I walk down to the front pew and I said, here's what I want you to do. I want you to shake the person's hand and say, hi, I'm Pastor Dave. And then they'll, you know, it's coming. So, all right. And then they'll tell you their name. All right. So everybody at coffee hour went up to each other and said, hi, I'm Pastor, Pastor Dave. Dave. <laughs> I can see that. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they, they were a little right? they didn't quite have it anyway. uh, they love each other but you know some days they just didn't have it anyway uh, <laughs> no, I can say I was there 15 years alright so I mean it was it was a good time right. most of the time it was a good time anyway. <laughs> after 15 years maybe they all knew each other or they knew him no. they knew him Everybody was past today. Anyhow. <clears throat> um, so hot and cold. Right? Um, lukewarm is not good. Ma makes us sick. Right? Okay. Uh, and we have to ask ourselves. Are we satisfied with how hot or how cold? You know, are we, you know, I mean, we don't want to be cold. We want to be hot. Right? But we certainly don't want to be lukewarm. But their problem is they think they're rich and have prospered and don't need anything. They think they're self-sufficient as Christians and as just people. Okay, but They're in a wealthy place. They're affluent like we are. So this letter is 
especially um, fitting for us. They say, you know, I, I have a lot of insurance. I have a lot of savings. My retirement plan is doing well. Uh, you know, I have a good job. We pay all our bills. We don't have any problem. We get to take a vacation every year. I'm rich. I've prospered. I don't need anything. I'm taken care of. I'm set for life. Yeah, but you can link, lose that plate right off. <laughs> I remember asking you okay. Okay. but we don't realize that, okay, that we are what oh this list is horrible wretched pitiable poor blind and naked in faith right okay your your faith is is wretched and pitiable you are you are poor you know you don't trust god you trust all your riches Okay. And then what does he say that they should do? Buy from me gold refined by fire, so that you may be truly rich. White garments, what does white garments signify? Purity, Purity. Purity salvation, righteousness. Okay. So that you may clothe yourself, and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen. Sab to anoint your eyes that you may see. Again, remember they were great medical city. They had great ointment for ears and eyes. So, okay. So here he's saying, you know, you need me. I can give you the real stuff. Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. We don't believe that as children, do we? When we're growing up, okay. <laughs> parents get real hard it's on us. They're trying to okay. And what do we what do we say to them, especially when we're a little bit younger? You know? Yeah, you don't love me anymore, okay? Or we or I hate you. You won't let me do anything I want to, you know. And if the parents are good, their response will always be, "That's okay. You can hate me. I love you." You just keep saying it, you know. Right. You gonna love me one day. <laughs> I said I loved you, but I don't like you right now. What you're doing, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. and always in that order. I love yeah. you first, uh -huh. and then yeah. yeah. Um, those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. So reprove is to to correct, point out what you're doing wrong, where where you're off base, what you don't understand, what you've got confused. Uh, you know, correct what's amiss. And discipline is training which may include punishment, okay? We always talk about athletes being very disciplined. Why? What do they do? They train. Very they train. Very they train. Very hard. They train, right? They've got this routine, and they train hard, and they practice a lot, right? Okay, so discipline is all about practicing what you're learning until you get it right. Okay, so he's going to reprove and discipline those whom he loves because... You need this for your own good. I used to hate it when my mom and dad said that. Mm -hmm. I'm doing this for your own good. <laughs> and I always want to say, please don't. <laughs> I'd rather learn the hard way. Do you ever like that? I always mm -hmm. would. I want to learn the hard way. So be zealous and repent. So if we're affluent and self-assured and, and think we don't need anything, how do we repent? What, what does repentance involve then for affluent, self-sufficient people? What if you're not helping with people or helping things if you're affluent and, and well set, whatever? Um, so you're not sharing? Yeah, yeah. It's still, you're it's still you may feel comfortable with yourself, but you, you better make sure other people are being comfortable, too. All right, so we have to repent of our selfishness mm -hmm. and greed and, and the fact that we don't share with others who aren't as blessed as we are. Okay. Now, the whole city's pretty wealthy, so maybe everybody there was pretty well off, but it doesn't mean that everybody in the world was, right? Mm -hmm. They, there were a lot of commerce and travel around that area, so they certainly okay, had opportunity to share with others. Okay. I mean, think of Paul when he's visiting his churches and collecting money to take back to Jerusalem for the church in Palestine. Okay. Right. okay, that would be one thing they could repent of. What else do affluent people need to repent of? 
they can they can handle it kind of like what you were saying at the beginning you have your taking it for granted taking i'm it taking for it for granted, granted i'm self-sufficient i don't i don't need god i've got everything yeah i've got everything i need type yeah. Of thing. Yeah. Okay. all right <clears throat> be zealous and repent what is zealous Enthusiastic. Hmm? Enthusiastic. Enthusiastic, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Passionate, committed. Okay. All right. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Who does Jesus say this to? All of them. The church, right? Not the unchurched. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he says this to the church. Preachers will often use this about unchurched unbelievers and say you got to let jesus into your heart he's not knocking at the unbelievers heart he's knocking at the church's door why does jesus have to knock at the church's door what has the church done If the door is shut and he's on the outside, what has the church done? Yeah. So he's saying, please let me back in my own church. <laughs> please let me back into my own church. And if you do, we'll sit down and eat together. We'll renew our fellowship. Okay? But let me back in. This is my church. The one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne. Because as I have conquered and sit with my father on his throne, you will sit with me. Which means we will be kings and rulers. We will help Jesus reign over the universe. Okay. All right. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Questions about that? All right. So what do you think about these letters to the churches? Jesus says, this is me talking to you. I have this against you. But, Tells him how to but, you're, good at, but you're good at this. Or you're good at this, but I have this against you. All right. So here's what you need to do. Here's what I'm asking of you. Okay. And if you're, if you're good at that and remain faithful and conquer, you'll get your reward. Right? That's the way the letters go. All right. So which of these did you like or not like or... They're all unique in their own way. Yeah. Uh, some of them, you know, more um, you needed more push than others, and some of them just needed to be reminded. Uh, okay. So. Yeah. So some were a little bit firmer and harsher than others. Mm -hmm. Okay. And some were two of them. We found out in the introduction were um, were real positive, nothing against them. And then two of them, there was nothing good about them, right? So, but I think in each and every one, there was something that every congregation can relate to. In each of the letters, there's a piece of us there. Or some of our people fit there. Some of our people fit another place, you know, but we're all in there, okay? Which is, again, why the, the whole Bible is relevant, because we're on every page, even though... We live two and three thousand years later than it was written. We're we're in this. Okay, this is us. People haven't changed. Okay, right. shall we move on to chapter four? The throne in heaven. <clears throat> it's mentioned in every chapter of Revelation except chapter two, eight, and nine. God covers Himself with light as a garment, which is taken from Psalm one hundred four. The one seated on the throne had the appearance of jasper and carnelian, a rainbow like an emerald and precious gems. There's no shape, no form. He's not identified as a human, even. Okay, just the, um, just his appearance. Okay, there are no shapes are used to describe God. Only brilliance. Jasper was a brilliant white, uh, showing the purity of God. Carnelian was a blood red for the wrath of God. Emerald is a soft green for the mercy of God. One way to look at it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right. 
So let's read chapter 4 before we uh, then we'll go back and look at this these slides. Okay. Chapter 4. After this, after what? After I dictated and wrote down these letters to the churches. After this I looked and behold. Behold means pay attention, stop and look. A door standing open in heaven. Now, one of these letters he just talked about an open door, right? Philadelphia? Okay. I have set before you an open door which no one is able to shut. Philadelphia, they were going to go out and make a witness wherever they wanted to go. They could go out and make a witness for Jesus. Now Jesus says, or John sees, a door standing open in heaven. And standing open is a verb in Greek that means it's always open. Okay, It's been propped open and won't be shut. Okay. The first voice, which I had heard speaking to me like a trumpet, way back in chapter 1, said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. Now, the letters to the churches, obviously, no matter where he was taking the dictation, okay, the letters to the churches are about things on earth, where the churches are. Right? Now, he says, Come up here to heaven, and I will show you must, what must take place. At once I was in the Spirit, which means, remember, it was in a trance kind of state, right? And behold, a throne stood in heaven, and with one seated on the throne. So the king is in the room. And he sat there and had the, and he who sat there had the appearance of Jasper and Carnelian, and around the throne was a rainbow that had the appearance of an emerald. <clears throat> around the throne were 24 thrones and seated on the thrones were 24 elders clothed <coughs> excuse me clothed in white garments with golden crowns on their heads from the throne the one throne not the 24 from the throne came flashes of lightning and rumblings and peals of thunder and before the throne were burning seven torches of fire which are the seven spirits of god well there they are again <coughs> Excuse me. And before the throne there was, as it were, a sea of glass, like crystal. Around the throne, on each side of the throne, are four living creatures, full of eyes in front and behind. Meaning, they've got eyes in the back of their heads. Right? They can see, they're not missing anything. They can see everything they need to see. <clears throat> the first living creature, like a lion. The second living creature, like an ox. The third living creature, like the face of a man. And the fourth living creature like an eagle in flight. And the four living creatures, each of them with six wings, are full of eyes all around and within. And day and night they never cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. And whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who is seated on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the twenty-four elders fall down before him who is seated on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. <clears throat> all right, so as we begin the larger vision after the letters, <clears throat> the first thing that John sees is a vision of God on the throne with those beings around him. So let's see if there's anything important in all of this. Well, of course there is. All right. So the one seated on the throne, <clears throat> as we pointed out already, is brilliant. Okay. Um, shimmering, shining, brilliant, like polished gems. Okay. Again, the jasper was probably a brilliant white. Showing the purity of God, the carnelian, a blood red uh, for the wrath of God, and the emerald, a soft green for the mercy of God. Okay. So, you got, you've got it all, right? Purity, mercy, and wrath. Okay. Always in the proper balance, I suppose. Huh? Okay. All right. Whoops. Next, uh, the 24 elders. They sit around the throne of God, clothed in white robes and golden crowns. What do white robes tell you? Purity. 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 Golden crowns. Kings. They're royalty. royalty. Okay. King, yeah, kings, royalty. 
okay? Dukes, duchess, whatever you want to call them, princes, princesses, all them, okay? But they cast their crowns before the throne. What does that tell you? What are they doing? What They're does that signify? Subjects to the larger yep. throne. I might be a king, but you're a higher king than me. <laughs> and so we submit to you, all right? They continually worship and praise. They bring the prayers of the saints. We'll see that later. Um, one of them encourages the seer. Again, much later. But these are all things that when the 24 elders are mentioned in Revelation, these are all the things that they're doing. Um, one interprets a vision. In Isaiah 24, verse 23, God is reigning in glory among his elders. The Babylonians had 24 star gods. So maybe this is a way for us to say, you know, you can think of your gods, but all the kings, all the royalty, all the mighty ones, they have to bow down to, to the one true God. <clears throat> the priests and Levites were divided into 24 courses for service to the temple. We've got 12 tribes and 12 apostles. Or could they just be the faithful people of God? I mean, we're, we're not sure what they represent okay but the symbolism is gives us enough to 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 get a point from it all right so around the throne there's also lightning and thunder in ezekiel 1 psalm 77 job 34 exodus 19 um god's voice god's presence often shows up with lightning and thunder uh the voice of of many waters that kind of thing all right um first shows up in exodus so um, anytime we see a voice or a presence like that, we always think it's a theophany, a revelation of God about God. He shows up someplace, okay. a theophany. The seven torches are the seven of the seven spirits. Okay. The action of the spirit is in every church. Um, so you've got the if you want to think of them as the, the seven angels who are always before the throne, the archangels, um, or the angels of the seven churches. Okay. Right. Uh, the Babylonians had seven planets or seven lights in their, um, what's the word? Uh, pantheon. Pantheon and, and uh, astrology. Their, oh, yeah, yeah. Um, but you, you know, that word. <laughs> I can't think of it. Anyway, the sea like glass before the throne. It was clear as crystal, which means it was rare and precious, dazzling purity. All right, okay, clear as crystal. What what are the were there three qualities of a diamond? Four C four C's. Four. C's. <laughs> P, four. <clears throat> Color, clarity, cut. carrot, and cut. And cut. And cut. Yeah. Cut. Okay. Clarity is is there's no impurities, no cracks, no. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's clear as crystal okay all right so which is rare and precious to find a, a stone that's pure that pure yeah okay all right um next slide four living creatures in isaiah 6 and ezekiel 1 are also mentioned there i always found near and around the throne and the lamb they have six wings and are full of eyes so I guess they can, well, with six wings, they, what they do? It says with two, they did what? <coughs> two, they covered, well, we had that in the yeah. Old Testament lesson yesterday. Right. Yeah. Two, they covered their face, two, they covered their feet, and two, they flew. Oh. Yeah. Um, Isaiah 6, right? Yep. So say that again. With two, they, two, they covered their face. Covered two, their face. Covered. So that's that's humility, right? Mm -hmm. I, I, you know, don't look at me. I'm not worthy. Mm -hmm. okay. Two, they covered their feet. A euphemism for their nakedness. Okay. Um, and then with two, they flew. Okay. Got to get around somehow. Okay. And full of eyes means they, they don't miss anything. They see everything that's going on. Okay. Constantly praising and worshiping. They have functions and duties to perform, so they're not just there. Mm -hmm. They represent the greatness, strength, and beauty of nature because we've got the lion, who's the king of beasts and the most noble. The ox, 
who is the supreme among cattle and the strongest, the eagle who is the swiftest and the supreme among birds <clears throat> as a, as a um, hunter and a raptor. A man has dominion, he's the wisest among all, or supposed to be. Right? Okay. All right. So man and nature worship God in the, in, as these four living creatures are represented. And then you might know that the lion, ox, eagle, and man are representative of, uh, were at the end of the second century attached to the four Gospels. Okay. Right. What did you say that they, they covered two with their face, two with their feet, and what? Two, 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 two they flew. Two, two they flew, okay. And I'm sorry, say that last one that you just said again. Two they covered their feet. No, no, the one before that. They're attached to the Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And John. They, they each have a an animal. Yeah, ones uh, like right because um, that's on our windows in church. Yeah, right. yeah. So, but I don't know which is which. I can't ever remember either. Um, next slide. <coughs> God the Creator and Christ the Liberator. Chapters 4 and 5 provide not only the setting for the breaking of the seals, but also the basis for understanding the whole book. Their central image is political. The throne image in Revelation 4, 5, right, all those verses, occurs again and again like a keynote symbol throughout the whole book. And then there's a whole lot of other references. Chapters 4 and 5 lay the rhetorical foundation and provide the key symbolic images for all that follows. So you're going to have to go back to chapter 1, that initial vision of the voice, right? In chapter 4 and 5, as you read the rest of the book, you'll be reminded of things about the one on the throne and the 24 elders and the four living creatures and all of that, <coughs> all the way through the book. Okay. <coughs> Um, we'll do this one, then we'll have quit, because I see by the clock on the wall, it's 8 o'clock. The central theological question of chapters 4 and 5. Who is the true Lord of this world? This theological question of power, or about power, is addressed and elaborated with cosmological imagery, which has, has to do with the whole cosmos, right? And symbolic language derived from Hebrew, Jewish, Hellenistic and Roman royal tradition and imagery. So if you don't know some of the symbolism and imagery and history of um, uh, the Greek and Roman empires and their um, religion and, and stuff, you're going to miss some of the stuff, right? Well, which is always true because if you didn't live in those times, you don't know a lot, right? Enthroned in eternal majesty and power, the victorious Christ, with God, exercises true lordship over the world. In chapter 3, verse 21, To those victorious I will grant a place on my throne, as I myself was victorious and shared the throne of my Father. Right? Okay. So, for next time, 5, 6, we'll, we'll keep talking about chapter 4 a little bit. In 5, 6, and 7. And maybe 8. You can read as much as you want. But, um, next week we will not have class because the pastors will be in uh, Orlando, Florida for our clergy retreat. So we will meet in two weeks. All right. If today's the 7th, that will be the 21st. What I did too. I didn't record on my thing. So this is the only recording we have. Today. Are you able to separate the sound from the video? I haven't tried that yet, but I can. I can make an attempt. In, in case. How do so, How do we play these if we need one? If we will be here the twenty first. I will put them on YouTube, and then I'll. I can just send you. It'll be on our church YouTube. Oh, channel. okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, okay. Yeah, just like I watch. Well, we're not here. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Easy enough. Okay. Sharon said she likes the video. That worked? Work? Yeah, it worked really well. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'm very phony, yeah. Jen.
Right? You are. Shall we? <laughs> Shall we? Yeah, right no, before we leave. <laughs> <laughs> Good and gracious God, we thank you that you are the Almighty, the one who sits on the throne for over and over. We learn that every time we really try to take charge, we only mess things up more and more. So help us every moment of the day to, to remain faithful to you, um, for you are the one who has rescued us, saved us, redeemed us, healed us, and, and given us new life. Help us always to praise you and all we say and do to be a witness to all of those around us, that they too may come to know you as Savior and Lord. Uh, be with us now as we go our separate ways. Get us safely where we need to be. For all this, we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.